spend as much as possible with you to swim meal, and I'm going to uh, open up the full prayer. <laughs> Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for this morning that your mercies and compassions are new every morning, that great is thy faithfulness. And I thank you, Lord, for the season of prayer that we've already had uh, this morning, for the songs uh, to invite and welcome your presence to be among us. And it is my purpose and desire to simply touch and agree with the prayers that have gone before mine and to consecrate myself to thee this morning as you prepare to study your sacred word. Lord, I thank you for bringing uh, many of us many miles to be able to come to this uh, week convocation. And Holy Father, it is our desire that we would not just come and just listen to more Bible and go back the same way. Hmm. We are living in a time where it is vital that we climb Peter's ladder and settle into truth both intellectually and spiritually so that we cannot be moved. This is the sealing process. Father, I desire to consecrate myself to Thee this morning, consent that You would enter Yourself, and pray that You please fill me and fill us with Your Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts, and may the Word of God, the double-edged sword, have a, an effect to cut out sin out of our lives, and to be able to produce within us the righteous character of Christ. So, Lord, please pour out Thy Holy Spirit, and speak to our hearts as our prayer, and may Your angels be here to open up our minds to comprehend the, not only the sacred truths for this time, but also the sacred preparation that we must enter into, practically speaking, that we might be ready for the coming of Christ. Mm. So Lord, be with us, please, as my prayer guide us in our thoughts, and may the truths, the simple, the simple truths of the gospel, both things new and old, draw us closer to thee this morning. We thank you in Christ's name for hearing our prayers. Amen. Amen. Once again, good morning to everyone. Good morning. I'm going to do that one more time. Good morning to everyone. Good morning. It always sounds better the second time around for some reason. Um, first and foremost, let me just say that I'm very thankful to uh, be here with all of you. Um, through many miles, and I apologize. I wasn't available yesterday for my talk. I was extremely <laughs> exhausted from the flight. Uh, so I appreciate your patience and allowing me to have a little bit of extra rest. Um, so we're going to go ahead and begin. As you can most likely see uh, from the screen to my left, uh, the topic that I'm going to be dealing with is going to be this week, John the Baptist. Um, to this morning for uh, the worship thought, this is going to be designed for this first hour just to lay a foundation. We're going to be laying a foundation for why we're studying this topic and uh, the different types of parallels uh, that we can learn from the example of John the Baptist. Uh, as we understand and study present truth for our time. Um, I have uh, quite a few slots throughout this week, um, and I'm going to, by God's grace, try to carry this theme uh, throughout this week and draw different uh, lessons from the life of John the Baptist that we can apply to our own lives. Now I'm going to go ahead and look at uh, a quotation. This is coming from Desire of Ages, pages 100 and 101, and this is going to really be our theme uh, quotation. Now, some people may be asking, well, you know, I'm, I've come here to listen to uh, prophecy lectures. And we are going to talk about some prophecy during this time. However, I believe that we're living in a time, uh, I just want to be as clear as possible, um, that we, many times, as believers in present truth today, we have a mind full of truth, a mind full of theology, a mind full of concepts, but uh, many times in our practical lives, we're not living them out. And so I believe that we're living in a time that we need to come, come past just this intellectual philosophy uh, that we oftentimes uh, profess as believers in present truth and a Millerite history being repeated in the latter rain and all these different concepts that, of course, I believe in and preach. But we have to move past just a, a, a intellectual understanding of what we believe and go into what we're actually doing in our lives. Uh, and so well, this is what we're going to be emphasizing by the grace of God. We're going to be looking at some practical uh, some practical things this week. Is that all right? Amen. Amen. So let's go ahead and look at this now. Desire of Ages, pages 100 to 101. We're going to just 
read through this paragraph by paragraph, several paragraphs, look at, and we're going to select some different things that Mrs. White emphasizes in regard to John the Baptist, and then the rest of this week I'll be looking at each aspect and then trying to expound upon those various things. Amen? Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and look at this now. John the Baptist, a reformer. <clears throat> Desire of Ages, pages 100 and 101. You can follow along with me. John was to go forth as Jehovah's messenger to bring to men the light of God. He must give a new direction to their thoughts. He must impress them with the holiness of God's requirements and their need of His perfect righteousness. Such a messenger must be holy. He must be a temple for the indwelling Spirit of God. In order to fulfill his mission, he must have a sound physical constitution and mental and spiritual strength. Therefore, it would be necessary for him to control the appetites and passions. He must be able so to control all his powers that he could stand among men as unmoved by surrounding circumstances as the rocks and mountains of the wilderness. In the time of John the Baptist, greed for riches and the love of luxury and display had become widespread. Sensuous pleasures, feasting, and drinking were causing physical disease and degeneracy, benumbing the spiritual perceptions and lessening the sensibility to sin. John was to stand as a what? As a reformer. What we're going to look at, we're going to look at how many different types of things he stood for in his reform. A lot of times we emphasize the fact that he was a health reformer. That was only one aspect. We'll continue with reading. John was to stand as a reformer. By his abstemious life and plain dress, he was to rebuke the excesses of his time. Hence, the directions given to the parents of John, a lesson of temperance by an angel from the throne of heaven. In childhood and youth, the character is most impressible. The power of self-control should then be acquired. By the fireside and at the family board, influences are exerted whose results are as enduring as eternity. More than any natural endowment, the habits established in early years decide whether a man will be victorious or vanquished in the battle of life. Youth is the sowing time. It determines the character of the harvest for this life and for the life to come. As a prophet, John was to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now this next sentence is a very important one. In preparing the way for Christ's first advent, he was a representative of those who are to prepare a people for our Lord's second coming. All right? Did you get that right there? We're going to emphasize that this morning. Jesus, uh, the spirit of prophecy tells us that John the Baptist was a representative of really the 144,000. The world is given to self-indulgence. Errors and fables abound. Satan's snares for destroying souls are multiplied. All who would perfect holiness in the fear of God must learn the lessons of temperance and self-control. The appetites and passions must be held in subjection to the higher powers of the mind. This self-discipline is essential to that mental strength and spiritual insight which will enable us to understand and to practice the sacred truths of God's Word. For this reason, temperance finds its place in the work of preparation for Christ's second coming. And then the last paragraph. In the natural order of things, the son of Zacharias would have been educated for the priesthood. <clears throat> we know that because his father was a priest. Zacharias was in the temple burning incense uh, in the temple of the Lord when the angel Gabriel came to him in the holy place, right? He was after the course of Abiah. So in the natural order of things, the son of Zacharias would have been educated for the priesthood. But the training of the rabbinical <coughs> schools would have unfitted him for his work. God did not send him to the teachers of theology to learn how to interpret the scriptures. He called him to the desert that he might learn of nature and nature's God. Now, there's a lot of things that are packed into these, just a few paragraphs, just out of this one chapter in the book, Desire of Ages. And what I want to do this morning, because I don't really have that much time this morning to develop this thought too much, so this is going to be just the laying of a foundation this morning as to the different things that we're going to study for the rest of the week. 
we learned several things. I'm not sure if uh, things stood out to you like they did to me when I first read this, but we're going to go ahead and go through them point by point to look at several different things that John the Baptist was called to do and the call to represent. So I went ahead and numbered them, all right? Now, you don't mind if we just do a little bit of Bible study this morning, do you? Uh, I'm assuming that this week we'll probably have a combination of teaching and preaching and so forth, and I'll probably do the same thing. But this morning, I want to not just preach at you, I want to be able to do some teaching, and that way nothing is lost in your mind. There's several different things I listed in regard to John the Baptist. Now, we're going to look at these things point by point throughout this week. Several different things, and I want you to make sure to write these things down. Number one, we learned that John the Baptist is a representative of those who will prepare the world for the second coming of Christ. And ultimately, we recognize that that group of people will be the 144,000, will it not? Now, we're going to find out something else that John the Baptist also represented William Miller. He represented the Millerite movement. We'll talk about that as well in a little bit. Number two, we find out that John the Baptist was a health and temperance reformer, was he not? We learned that the angel Gabriel told him, uh, told the parents uh, a lesson of temperance from the throne of heaven. Number three, he was a dress reformer. Did you read that? When you, did you catch that? In the spirit of prophecy, it said by his abstemious life and plain dress. He was to be able to rebuke the excesses of that time. So he was not only a health and temperance reformer, but he was also a dress reformer as well, with simple plain dress. Number four, we recognize that he came to restore the family unit. He came in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Correct? Amen. So family restoration would play a work in the end time preparation for the coming of Christ. Now, as you look at each one of these things as you write them down, please don't let this concept pass by you that all of these things that John the Baptist stood for are the things that we must also practice. Not only believe up here, but also practice practically in order to prepare for Christ's coming as well. Amen? Amen. Number five. Did you catch that one? Really important one. Number five is educational reform. We're told in that very last paragraph that the rabbinical schools of theology of that time would have unfitted John the Baptist for his work. Right? So he did not go to the schools of theology of his time, even though it was God's professed people. It was God's, it was God's system uh, of... Uh, well, it was not as God's system of education, but it was God's denominated people, the Jews back then, was it not? And yet John the Baptist was not able to attend the schools of his time, so educational reform. Number six, he practiced country living, did he not? It says that he went and learned of nature and of nature's God. So one of the great books uh, of uh, Revelation, one of the great books that God gave to us to learn from. Number seven, we're going to also find out later on this week that John the Baptist was a representative of those who would engage in self-supporting work. And we'll look at that later on. We recognize that John the Baptist did not recognize the authority of the Sanhedrin. Remember, he came out, they questioned him as his authority, and he simply rebuked them. He was a self-supporting minister. Number eight, we're also going to learn from John the Baptist's example that he preached a practical gospel. We'll look at that later on in Luke chapter 3. He preached a practical gospel. It wasn't just theology up in the head. He gave people practical steps of how to be able to live a Christian life. And then number nine, which we'll look at later on this week, he also preached a prophetic gospel, which we'll find out was entitled as the wisdom of the just. And we'll look at that later on. Amen? So does everyone have that written down now? All right. So now, there may be some other things that I have, I have missed when I read this. But these were the things that have stood out, uh, that stood out to me the most when I read this par these paragraphs and also read some different portions of the scriptures. Let's go ahead and look at this now in regard to John the Baptist as a type of the 144,000, as a type of Elijah. Let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. Now, all of these things are going to be extremely familiar and probably a little bit basic to most of us here. <clears throat> However, again, my desire this week is not to emphasize a lot of theology in our minds because I think that most people here, uh, uh, I'm assuming, because uh, I'm assuming that most people here understand the, basic, uh, the basics of these two charts. Yes? Does everyone here understand that? The basics of these two charts? Yes. Matter of fact, I'm assuming that most of you also understand a lot more than just the basics of the prophetic gospel today. We understand that we're living in the time of the latter rains. This is September 11, 2001. How many of you understand that one as well? Do you understand this? So, we already understand these things. We already understand the third world. We understand the history of Islam. We understand the different time prophecies. We understand, uh, we understand about the daily. We understand about Millerite history being parallel. We understand about many of these things. We understand about the unsealing of the little book of Daniel. 
and all the different light that's coming from the book of Revelation. We understand these different things, do we not? Amen. Yes? yes? So my purpose this week is not to re-emphasize many of the same things that you already know and maybe bring out a little thought here, a little thought there to, to expand on that, but it's to emphasize the necessity of translating that intellectual stuff up here into a practical living experience in our lives. You understand this, friends? Because we're told in great controversy that the sealing work is not a seal that you can see, but it is a settling into truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. Right? Now, we all believe that Sunday laws will be passed uh, at some point in time in the United States, will it not? I believe there's going to be a lot more crisis than we really think. Uh, this is from my own personal study. I don't think a Sunday law is going to be just uh, drop on the American people. I'm an American. I'm living in that society over there. And I believe there's going to be a series of real serious crises to break the back of the American people, to break the economy, and so forth. And so we have to ask ourselves, how are we living? What are we doing? And are we spiritually, practically preparing for the stuff that we tell people is going to happen? You understand this, friends? And this is what I want to emphasize this week. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and let's now look at the story of the birth, the miraculous birth of John the Baptist. Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 5. And when you're there, please just let me know by saying amen. amen. The Bible says in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, verse, beginning with verse 5, and we're just going to look a little bit at the story in regard to the birth, the miraculous birth of John the Baptist. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Abiah. Now, before I continue on, does this, does this sound a little bit fuzzy? Is this the battery in this, or is that just the way the speaker sounds? I just want to make sure. It sounds like my voice is a little bit fuzzy. Yeah, it yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm just curious. Is, is it, is this, was the battery checked before? Yeah. Okay, all right. Let's continue on then. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, verse 5, Luke chapter 1, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. Now look here now in verse 11. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense, which we recognize was the hand of favor. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, but thy prayer is heard. Thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice in his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of who? Elias. Elias, which is Elijah. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And who was this that told him this message? It's in verse 19. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. Very interesting. These glad tidings. The glad tidings that come in the spirit and power of Elijah. Of course, that ties directly to Daniel chapter 11, verse 43 and 44. Now, we recognize that John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now, there are a lot of prophetic parallels. I think a lot of us already understand about that, correct? Yes? Everyone here understands the basics of triple application principles and so forth. And you know what's interesting about this is that there are actually, we often talk, times talk about there are three Elijahs, there's actually four Elijahs uh, when you really look at that. And the reason why is there is because uh, who was the first Elijah? Elijah. 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 That's an easy one, right? Elijah was, he was the first Elijah. Who was the second Elijah? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Who was the third Elijah? William Miller. William Miller. Who was the fourth Elijah? The fourth, fourth Elijah. Exactly. So there's actually four Elijah's. Now, when you look at this aspect, however, just based on a triple application principle, we know that there were enemies of God against Elijah. There was a king and a woman, and there was also the false prophets of Baal that did the dance of deception. We already know that, don't we? And that parallels also John the Baptist's day when there was also threefold demon against him, a king, a woman, and a young lady who did a dance of deception. 
And the end of time, we know there's also threefold union, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And we know that also there'll be another dance of deception. The false prophet will bring down fire from God out of heaven and deceive the kings of the earth. Uh, by the way, um, just on a side note, because we're dealing with practical things, um, does anyone know who the modern day prophets of Baal are? I, I have a, a little series on that issue about the prophets of Baal. What were the prophets of Baal doing, by the way? Now, this is not my topic right now, but it does tie into reform, if you want to be a reformer. Because the prophets of Baal, what were they doing on Mount Carmel? What were they doing? Sun worship. What's that? Sun worship. Okay, yes, they were, they were sun worshippers. All right, they worshipped Baal, the sun god of Phoenicia. Uh, what were they doing? What were they dancing. doing? They were dancing. Exactly right. The Bible says that they were leaping on the altar and they were cutting themselves, right? And when you go back and read different portions like in Leviticus 19, Leviticus 21, it talks about thou shalt not cut thyself nor print any marks upon you for the dead and so forth. Anyone ever read that before? Yeah. So these, these false prophets were dancing and they were singing and they were cutting themselves and that cutting themselves not just means with lancets but the pagans also would pierce themselves and tattoo themselves, etc. And if you look at the modern day prophets of Baal, those that like to dance, leap on the altar, those that sing and those that tattoo and pierce themselves. This is the modern day music industry, brothers and sisters. Yeah. When you look at the modern day rappers yeah. and the modern day rock and roll industry, these are the false prophets of Baal, brothers and sisters. These are the prophets of Baal that are causing our young people to worship Satan. And this is something that I have a burden for because I myself came out of this worldly issue. Now, when you look at Luke chapter 1, the spirit of power lies. Let's go down to the Gospel of Matthew and find out that Jesus very clearly tells us that John the Baptist was Elijah to come. All right? We're just laying a foundation. You don't mind that. Amen? Amen. All right? So don't fall asleep on me now. All right? Don't, 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 get, don't get bored this morning. All right? We're just looking at some basics. We're laying a foundation in regard to John the Baptist. Coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. Matthew chapter 11. Let's go ahead and look now. Matthew 11. Where Jesus says that John the Baptist represents Elijah. Matthew 11, and we're going to pick it up now in verse 7. Now, this is a story. Are we all familiar with the story about when John got locked up in prison and he became very discouraged and he sent his disciples to go to Jesus to ask him, you know, are you the Messiah to come? Everyone remember that? Amen. And Jesus told him, go back and tell John what you've seen. You know, the dead are raised, the blind see, the deaf hear, etc. And blesses he that's not offended me. He's a little, a little mild reproof. John, don't lose your faith now. And then he turns around, Jesus turns around and addresses the multitude about John. Notice what Jesus says beginning in verse 7. And as he departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? <laughs> But what went ye out for to see a man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing, fancy clothing, are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see a prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And by the way, Jesus is not only quoting Isaiah here, he's quoting Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. Okay? Yet they recognize that wherever Jesus quoted scripture, Jesus was quoting the Old Testament. All the parables are based upon Old Testament things as well. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you will receive it, this is who? Yes. Elijah, which was for to come. Man, there's, you know, there's so many parallels in here I really want to bring up. I'm not sure how much time I have right now. I have half an hour left this morning. But when you look at this issue of John the Baptist coming in the spirit and power of Elijah, it says right here, he quotes Malachi chapter 3. Let me just go into this very quickly to explain a few things. Go to Malachi chapter 3, because Jesus just said that this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Now notice that Jesus is directly quoting Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. Now, I want to just very quickly lay a foundation on some prophetic parallels right now as we also talk about some practical things. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, 
And let's notice what Jesus was quoting. The Bible says, are we all there together, friends? Amen? Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, Behold, I will send my what? Messenger. My messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Now, where did we just read that? We just read that with Jesus quoting that in Matthew chapter 11, correct? So Jesus is quoting Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. So Jesus recognizes that Malachi is dealing with John the Baptist as his messenger, and Jesus is recognizing himself as the Lord of the temple in this verse. All right? Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And who? The Lord. the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. So here we have that Jesus recognizes that he is the Lord of the temple. John the Baptist was the messenger. And that Jesus was about to come to his temple to start this cleansing work, right? Now we know that there were some parallels here. Jesus literally did that in his day, did he not? Yeah. Did Jesus literally recognize John the Baptist as the messenger right here in Malachi 3 verse 1, yes or no? Amen. Yes. And did he literally come to the temple and cleanse that temple? Yes, he did. He cast out the money changers and all the, drove out those with cattle and with pigeons and with sheep. Amen? Amen? But we also recognize that Jesus, prophetically speaking, as the Lord of the covenant, was about to come to the heavenly temple during that history, was he not? Amen. Now, write this down because we're going to go into this parallel, God willing, later on this week. That in these, this threefold application of Elijah, and we learned that the threefold application. All right, thank you very much. We learned that the threefold application of Elijah after Elijah was John the Baptist, William Miller, and then also the 144,000 of the end time people of God. <laughs> yes or no? <coughs> so when you look at those three aspects, all right, John the Baptist, Millerite history, and our history. When you look at those three aspects, which I believe is the fulfillment of the threefold history of Joel, threefold history of Joel chapter 2. When you look at this history, we find that there has to be an Elijah message in all of these different histories, right? Yes? I, I wish I had a board. I'd write it down. I don't have a, there, is. there is a board over there. Oh, it's way over there. Okay. Should I, should I bring it over here? Thank you. Let me just go ahead and just take some time to look at this. Should I, you want me to walk over there? Oh, that's fine. I can do that. I guess you guys will follow me on the camera. Oh, okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, I think that'll work. Let me just pick up this little bit. Can everyone see that okay? Yeah. Yes? This is not going to fall over on me, is it? Probably. Probably it will. All right, I'm going to try to be careful. When you look at this threefold history of Elijah, we know that after Elijah we had John the Baptist, correct? This is really the history, this is the history of Christ. Because he was the messenger for Christ to come. Was he not? Yeah. We also look at a second history. We know that also he represents William Miller. Yes? Yeah. He represents this history. And then he also represents those that will prepare the world for the second coming of Jesus. We just read that, right? 145,000. And in each of these histories, we know that... The Elijah message is fulfilling Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, is it not? It's fulfilling the fact that there has to be a messenger to go before the face of the Lord to prepare the way before him for what? But, but read it, Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. We all agree that we don't mind a Bible study here, right? Amen? Amen. So rather than me just preaching at you, I'm going to ask you questions. So if John the Baptist is Elijah, he's fulfilling Malachi 3 verse 1. Let's read it again. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, right? Mm -hmm. So if he's going before him, right? Walking in front of him, as it were, going before him, where is the Lord going? Where, 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 what's that? Behind him. Okay, behind him, but where is the Lord going towards? He's, he's preparing the way towards something, somewhere, right? The sanctuary. Toward the temple, toward the sanctuary. It says it right here, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. temple. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, say the Lord of hosts. So listen, pay attention, okay, please. 
So notice what this is. The Elijah message must prepare the people, must prepare the way for Christ to come to his temple, must prepare the way for people to follow Jesus to the temple, to the sanctuary. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. So, when we look at this issue, in all three of these histories, in the history of John the Baptist, who fulfilled the prophecy of Elijah, Jesus himself said it, did he not? This is Elijah to come. In the history of William Miller, which we're about to read right now, in early writings, page 229, you may want to jot that down, early writings, page 229, paragraph 2, William Miller represents also uh, Elijah and also John the Baptist. And then also the end of time, 145,000, we just read that, that John the Baptist, let's read that again right here, this next, right there, because I have it, it's page 101, paragraph 2. In preparing the way for Christ's first advent, he was a representative of those who are to prepare a people for our Lord's second coming. That means that if these people also prepare the way for the Lord, it has to be an understanding of what the Lord is doing in his temple. Amen. Yes? Yes. Amen. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and look at this issue, all right? Because this is extremely important to understand. The very first history, the history of John the Baptist, we know that Jesus was about to transition his work. He was trying to guide the minds of his people to the fact that he was about to transition from the courtyard, which is the earth, to the holy place. Yes or no? Yes? Now, I, I, did, I did not uh, include these quotations, but... Uh, there's def different quotations in the pen of inspiration that talk about the fact that Jesus was trying to lift up the minds of his people to the fact that he was about to sweep away the entire Jewish economy. You know, all, these earthly sanctions, uh, all these earthly sacrifices, all this, the earthly sanctuary was about to go away, was it not? Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, he even told them that your house is left unto you desolate. He was, going to, he was trying to direct their minds to the fact that he was transitioning his work from an earthly work to a heavenly work. But the entire earthly priesthood was about to be swept away and he was about to become the high priest. Yes? So let me write that down now. You're gonna, these things are going to click in your mind here throughout this week as well. So John the Baptist, in preparing the way for Christ's first advent, was also preparing the way for Christ to come to his temple. Jesus was about to go from the courtyard which represents earth, does it not? Yes. Does the courtyard represent earth? Yes. You all understand that, don't you? Yes. That's where the sacrifice took place. That was when the Lamb of God was slain for the sins of the world. So he was going to go from the courtyard to the where? Holy place. From the courtyard to the holy place. In the days of William Miller, Jesus was already in the holy place, was he not? Yes. Jesus has been in the holy place since his ascension in 31 AD, right? Amen. And William Miller was to direct the people's minds to the Lord's coming as well, right? Amen. The Lord's coming where? To the temple, correct? And he was going to transition from the holy to the most holy. Most holy place. And why? What began taking place in the most holy place? Of course, we know that was 1844, correct? Judgment. October 22nd. Okay, judgment. <coughs> judgment of judgment of who? The living. So in 1844, Jesus was transitioning his work from the holy place to the most holy place to begin the judgment of the righteous dead. Now, John the Baptist represents those who are to prepare a people for our Lord's second coming. That means also they have to direct the people's minds to the Lord's coming to his temple once again, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes? So what is the final aspect of the work of God? Jesus would be from the most holy, the most holy place, where we already said that was the judgment of the dead, correct? So what is the final aspect of judgment that must take place just before Michael stands up and probation closes? What's that? The judgment has to transition from the judgment of the dead to the judgment of the living. To the judgment of the living. Now, doesn't that make sense, though? Because 144,000, are they dead or alive to see Jesus come? They're alive. Okay. Well, I, thought, you know, there's, I believe there's going to be a few people that are going to be alive to see Jesus come that will be alive and will not taste death. Do you believe that? Yes. Okay. So if that's the case, that means their sins have to be blotted out while they're still alive. So they have to be judged. Right? And they have to live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Do they do that? Anybody ever read that before in the Book of Red Controversy? 
So that means that at some point in time, we're just looking at some basics for those especially who are watching, maybe they don't understand this concept, but the point is, at some point in time, judgment has to transition from the dead to the living, because Jesus will come and there will be people alive to see him come. That the Bible say every eye will see him. And even they which pierced him, of course, that would be a special resurrection for them. It will be a special resurrection for all those who have died under the third angel's message, keeping the Sabbath. But the point is, there will be wicked who are alive to see Christ come. All the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, Matthew 24 says. And there will also be those who are righteous who are alive to see Jesus come. Will they not? Yes. So the final aspect of judgment that John the Baptist represents, the 144,000, they will point the minds to the final aspect of judgment, which will be the most holy place from the judgment of the dead to the judgment of the living. And then probation will close. Now, let me explain something else. Let me put this thought out here with my last 15 minutes I have. In each of these histories, God first and foremost brings the message of a transitional work in the sanctuary. He first and foremost brings that message to his professed people. All right? And if I let me just read that to you, the very familiar quotation, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. 1 Peter 4, verse 17. All throughout the scriptures we see that God is consistent in bringing truth first to his people and then to the Gentiles. It's called to the Jew first and then also to the Gentile. Anyone ever heard those different things before? Mm -hmm. Salvation for the Jew first and to the Gentile. God's with festival first and then those who don't with us. 1 Peter 4, verse 17. When you're there, amen. amen. 1 Peter 4, verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at where? The house of God. And if it what? First begin at us, what shall we envy of them that obey not the gospel of God? So it first has to begin with the house of God. Does it not? Amen. All right. Also, let's look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. The Bible says this. Let's go quickly now. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is this power of God and the salvation to everyone that believe it. To who first? The Jews. To the Jew first, God's professed people, and then also to the... Greek. So we see this all throughout the scriptures that God, first of all, sends a message to those who should know better. Right? To, to those that should be taking a message to the world. Yes or no? Amen. So when we look at each of these histories, do we see that God is consistent? How many of you believe that God is consistent? Amen. Does God work the same yesterday, today, and forever? What does Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 says? It says that the Lord is, uh, the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. All through the scriptures, God is the same. So who were God's professed people back in the days of John the Baptist? The Jews. The Jews. Do we all agree with that? Yeah. National Israel. Now we know that, of course, the northern tribe had been dispersed prior to this time. And then we had the, of course, they were called Jews, named after the tribe of Judah. But God's professed people were <coughs> the Jews. Yes? And the message of reform, first of all, came through John the Baptist to God's professed people. Did it not? It came to the Jews. And what was the message about? It was preparing them to understand the transitional work of Christ in connection with the sanctuary. Was it not? Then look, my people, wake up. Wake up. I'm about to transition my work from the courtyard to the holy place. Now pay close attention, all right? If God's professed people refuse to understand the work of Christ in transitioning His work, if they refuse to understand this, and if they refuse to enter into that work, you know what happens? Christ bypasses them, goes to another group of people, and probation closes upon God's professed people. And one step further than that, Satan will then take control of those professed people that don't understand the transitional work. You say, well, how can you prove that? All right, let's just go through that. When did the Jews, think about this, when did the Jews, um, well, you know, this is kind of interesting. According to the, the spirit of prophecy, when did the Jews actually <coughs> seal, uh, when did the Jewish leadership seal their, seal their, uh, their fate, their rejection of Christ? Yeah. Actually, no, when you read the spirit of prophecy, Mrs. White actually says it was not the crucifixion. Now we know that in AD 34, that was the close of probation upon national Israel, but the leadership sealed their rejection of, of their rejection of Christ at AD 31 when they crucified him. We're told that Satan took possession of them. That demons in the form of human beings were actually cooperating with them in that work. 
Uh, matter of fact, even after his resurrection, they just continued to uh, persecute them and so forth until 34 AD. We know that Michael stood up. Did he not? At the end of the seven <coughs> weeks. Anyways, when you look at this issue, close of probation upon the Jews, they refused to acknowledge that Christ had transitioned from the courtyard to the holy place, and who, what power took control of the Jewish nation when probation closed upon them? The power of Satan. All right, by a show of hands, because I, I, I didn't uh, include all these quotes after quotes after quotes. So, so I just have to assume that you've all read the book Great Controversy. Has everyone here ever read the book Great Controversy? Yes? Everyone here has? Yeah. So you've all read chapter 1, The Destruction of Jerusalem? Yeah. Yes? And Mrs. White brings out very clearly that who was in control of the Jewish nation during that time? Satan. Satan, Satan was in control, perfect control of the Jewish nation. So pay attention now. So very first, the first step. The first step is God sends a message of reform, an Elijah message to God's professed people. Right? When God sends an Elijah message to God's professed people, it's in regard to the work of Christ in the temple. Yes? Amen. If that message is accepted, then by faith they enter into that work with Christ. Right? If it's rejected, then who controls that people? Satan, Satan controls that people. You're all, are you all getting this? Yeah. Second example, in the days of William Miller. Now let me go ahead and read the fact that William Miller, uh, let's go ahead and look at this, early writings, page 229. I'm going to go ahead and pass by. We, we already know this one, like God sent his angel to move upon the heart of the farmer. We already know that quote, right? Let me go ahead and read this next one. As William Miller, as he followed down the prophecies, he saw that the inhabitants of the earth were living in the closing scenes of this world's history, yet they knew it not. He looked at the churches and saw that they were corrupt. They had taken their affections from Jesus and placed them on the world. Very interesting. We're going to find out that John the Baptist, as well as William Miller's day, uh, well, I'll, I'll say that. They were seeking for worldly honor instead of that honor which coming from above, grasping for worldly riches instead of laying up their treasure in heaven. Kind of a, kind of a lay of the scene condition, is it not? Even in William Miller's day. He could see hypocrisy, darkness, and death everywhere. His spirit was stirred within him. God called him to leave his farm as he called Elisha to leave his oxen and the field of his labor to follow Elijah. With trembling, William Miller began to unfold to the people the mysteries of the kingdom of God, carrying his hearers down through the prophecies to the second advent of Christ. With every effort, he gained strength. Now notice this last sentence. As John the Baptist heralded the first advent of Jesus and prepared the way for his coming, so William Miller and those who joined with him proclaimed the second advent of the Son of God. So do we see that John the Baptist represents also the Millerites? Yes or no? Amen. Yes. So that means that the same principles have to apply. Does it not? Amen. Yes or no? Amen. So John the Baptist represents William Miller. Excuse me. John the Baptist represents that Elijah message during that history shows the transitional work of Christ from the courtyard of the holy. Therefore, William Miller, who also came in these same footsteps, prepared the world for the coming of Christ, he would also point God's people from to the work of Christ in the temple, but this time from the holy to the most holy. So let's look at that now. So during the history of William Miller, who were God's professed people during this history? What's Protestantism. Thank you, I saw that. The Protestants, do we all agree with that? We know that the first and second angel's message, messages went to the Protestant churches, did they not? Yes? Yes. <laughs> Even the second angel's message, when it says Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that was referring to the Protestant denominations in the 1800s, was it not? Mm -hmm. Yes, and we're, we'll read that very clearly in the spirit of prophecy. It was not even dealing with the Catholic Church. Mrs. White says the Catholic Church had already been in a fallen condition for many years. So the second angel's message that went forward between 1842 down to the summer of 1844, this was primarily pointing toward the Protestant denominations that had rejected the first angel's message, yes? Now let's look at that now. So the Protestants, did they accept or reject by far, by large, the large majority, did they accept or reject the message that Christ was coming to the temple? They rejected it. They rejected it. And so as a result, God's with those people up here in this application, when they rejected the message of Christ coming to his temple, what power, what spirit took control of the nation? Satanic. Satanic spirit. In this history in 1844, we are told in the book Early Writings, there's, a, there's a, uh, a vision called the end of the 2300 days. You've all read that before? Where it says that Mrs. White saw Jesus as a great high priest, a bell and a pomegranate around his hem. And it said that it was different companies. Some were earnestly pleading for light, etc. And, and other ones seemed 
uh, indifferent and angels came to the ones that were bleeding and all of a sudden Jesus said wait here I am going to receive my kingdom in a little while I'll return and then by faith some went in with him and there they, she saw Jesus uh, pleading with the Father in a bright light would come from the Father to the Son and then the Son would breathe on this company you know what I remember that? Yeah. And in that breath was light and power and also character pepper, uh, a character change of sweet love, joy, and peace. And then she was shown the other company who did not, by faith, go in with Jesus in the most holy place. And she said it appeared as if Satan took control of that work. And when they would pray, Father, grant us thy spirit, Satan would breathe upon them an unholy influence. And in it was light and power. But no sweet love, joy, and peace. Yes? So the point is, according to the spirit of prophecy, in 1844, what power, what spirit took control of those that refused to recognize Christ coming to the temple? Satan. So Satan took control of God's professed people that refused to enter into the holy place during that history. In 1844, Satan took control of the Protestants, God's professed people, that refused to enter into the work of judgment in the most holy place in 1844, the judgment of the dead. Yes? And in our history, because we just read John the Baptist represents those that will live in the end of time, 144,000, right? So the same principles apply. Yes? And we already said that the judgment must transition from the dead to the living. There's many quotes about that. We already even know the book of Acts. The book of Acts even says that it was Jesus that God raised up to be judge of the quick and the dead. Anyone ever read that before? Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead. So the final work must be the judgment of the living. So look, follow me now. Who are God's professed people today? So in the history of the Laos to see in church, we know that Seventh-day Adventists are God's professed people. So therefore, the message of reform and the message pointing people's minds to the closing scenes of judgment, the message that is that needs to point God's people to the closing work of Christ in the temple has to go to the house of God first. It has to go to God's people first. Does it not? Amen. It has to go to spiritual Israel first. There's no other denomination on planet earth that fulfills the biblical understanding of who spiritual Israel is. By the way, you know that the only prophecy, the only time prophecy that proves that the Seventh-day Adventist people are Israel is the 2520. Because this is scattering and the gathering. You understand that, don't you? It shows you that in 1844, God gathered a covenant-keeping, Sabbath-keeping people. That's just crazy. When people reject that, they say, oh, it's not a, you know, it's not a prophecy, etc., etc. They're rejecting the very prophecy that points to Adventism being spiritual Israel. We know that, don't you? You know that each time prophecy represents something different, don't you? And we know that there's no more time prophecy after 1844. I, I don't believe there's any more. We can reapply time prophecy. I'll make it clear. I, I understand there's some different... I don't know why there's an argument going on over that. Very, very clear that after 1844, there's no more application of the day of principle. And I don't, th I don't believe there's any application of some so-called day-for-day principle. That whole day-for-day -day principle came from the Jesuits back in the Council of Trent, December 13th, 1545. This whole reapplication of time prophecy thing is, I think, a huge distraction. When we look at this whole issue about no more time prophecy, yet the subject matter of each prophecy is still valid and binding today. Amen. You say, what do you mean by that? Well... Islam, Islam and prophecy. We know that there, the first row, we had five months, 150 years. The second row, we had 391 years and 15 days. Is there any more of that time prophecy left? No. 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 However, does the subject matter of Islam still valid today? Amen. So although the time prophecy is no longer valid because it was done in 1840, yet the subject matter of Islam is still present true. The 1260-year prophecy, which we recognize, goes from 538 down to 1798. 1260 years. Again, many people are trying to reapply that as well for day for day and saying there's going to be three and a half little years and all, you know, trying to point the Sunday laws, etc. I've been hearing that for years and years. It's never going to happen because no more application of time prophecy. But from 538 to 1798, we have 1260 years. Is that time prophecy uh, still valid? What I mean by valid is valid, but is it still uh, applicable to reapply 1260 years today? No. No. But is the subject matter of the papacy ruling the world still valid in the present chapter? Yes. Yes. 20 other days. You got it. Are you, are you, all, are you all getting the point here? So although the 2300 day prophecy cannot be reapplied, yet the subject matter is still the same because it's pointing to what Christ is doing in cleansing the sanctuary. The 2520. 
You cannot reapply the 2520 in the time prophecy anymore today because it expired in 1844. Yet the subject matter of the gathering of Israel is still valid today. Are you all together with me on this thing? Now, let's go ahead and try to wrap this up. John the Baptist, who represents Elijah, was to point God's people to the transitional work of Christ in the temple. <coughs> they rejected it, and Satan took control of the nation. Yes? yes? By the way, Satan took control of the nation even before the close of probation. It's, and I already quoted that before, or referenced that. Was Satan possessing the leadership even before 34 AD? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Same thing with Protestantism. What happened there, brothers and sisters? Was Satan possessing the Protestants to reject and to, as it were, spiritually crucify the Millerites yeah. and to persecute them, etc., etc.? Absolutely. Even before the close of probation in 1844 on them, Satan still was influencing their leadership. And then, of course, at the end of time, God's professed people are the Seventh day Adventist church, and the Elijah message must point people's minds to what Christ is doing in the temple. The Lord is coming to his temple. Right? So I have a question for you. If this understanding is rejected, is God the same yesterday, today, and forever? Yes. So if back then, when the Jews, God's professed people, rejected this understanding, they were possessed by a satanic spirit, a spirit of opposition. They didn't even know what spirit was possessing them. And in this history, if the Protestants rejected this understanding of the closing work of Christ in the temple, and Satan possessed them, <coughs> breathed on them an unholy influence. Now what's happening today? Same thing. So the message of reform in our history is to point our people to the final cleansing work in the sanctuary, the blotting out of sin. That's all it is. And yet there is a spirit that is possessing our people of opposition and rejection and persecution. What spirit is that, brothers and sisters? It's the spirit of the dragon. And the exact same thing is taking place today as that Satan is taking possession of God's people today, brothers and sisters. It's exactly what is taking place today. You understand this principle right here. You understand what is, what is happening. Amen. And it's really scary, brothers and sisters. It is not, it's not, it, this is not saying anything by way of condemnation. This is simply looking at the pattern and that when God works the same yesterday and today, He'll always work the exact same way. There's a message that tests God's people that's always connected to His transitioning work in the sanctuary. Amen. That is the crux of the message today. You understand this, friends? That is the crux of the message today. Don't get distracted by all the little debates. You know, uh, uh, you know, Leviticus 26, the Hebrew doesn't say this, and blah, blah, blah. That's also a big distraction, brother. It's a total distraction, brothers and sisters. The whole punchline of the message today is that we are living in the final closing scenes of the atonement in the sanctuary of the most holy place. Amen. And that Christ has brought out sin and the judgment of the living. That's the entire that's the punchline. That's the whole point. That's the whole focus of the message today. Do you understand that? Amen. That's what's happening. All the different prophecies that we preach, all the different things that we teach, must point people to the closing scenes of the judgment in the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. That's what Daniel 11, 40 through 45 was all about. Because Daniel 12, verse 1, Michael stands up, the judgment's over. So the final prophetic movements must point us to the work of preparation for the close of probation and the blotting out of sin. Do you understand this? Amen, yeah. This is what it's all about. So what's happened today? Leadership rejected. John the Baptist, who is a type of the 144,000, who is a health reformer, <laughs> a dress reformer, and preaches family restoration, and education reformer, and country living, and represents self-supporting work, who preached a practical gospel, and also pointed people back to the wisdom of the just, which we'll find out as a prophetic gospel. All of these things, friends, must be entered into our experience in order to have our sins blotted out. And we're living in a time now where it's far past the time to just be intellectually theorizing mm -hmm. about prophecy. Now, am I de-emphasizing prophecy? No. Not at all. But if the object of prophecy is not being lived out, then it's all in vain. Mm -hmm. You understand this? Yeah. So John the Baptist, as I close, represents not only the people who are living to prepare the world for the coming of Christ, but John the Baptist represents the lifestyle, the activity, the actions, the character, the spirit, the, what we must be. Not just what we must preach, but what we must be. 
to be ready for the coming of Christ and to see him without spot and without blemish and that we might be blameless and holy in the sight and be ready for the coming of Christ. Amen? Amen. So throughout this week, today, this morning, this was just a worship thought this morning. This is just the laying of the foundation this morning. The rest of this week, we're going to go into the different aspects of these things to make it practical, not just intellectual, but practical, what you and I must be doing to get ready for Christ to come. Amen. 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 How many of you want to enter into that work by faith like I just did? Why don't we kneel together and close the prayer? Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I thank you for being with us this morning just to help to open our eyes even just a little bit this morning to recognize that we are living in the closing scenes of the judgment. Father, I, did, I not only pray for my brothers and sisters here, I not only pray for those who are watching, I pray for myself. I pray individually for myself, for my family. I pray for us corporately. That dear God of heaven, you would please help these truths to go far past just an intellectual assent, a mere assent to intellectual truth, and help these truths to sink down into our very souls. Mm -hmm. And that would translate into a practical walk with Jesus day by day. That we might not only have new lifestyles, but that we might have united homes, families, spiritual children. That we might live in the right environment to represent your character, to reflect upon those things that are pure and righteous and holy in nature. There's so many things that are out of harmony, perhaps, with us, between us and you. But I thank you that the gospel of Christ is a restoration message to restore our characters back into the image of God and also to restore right relationships and to restore a right relationship between us and thee. We thank you that Christ came in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And Lord, it is our desire to reach up higher to grasp a hold of this righteousness this, that is a free gift. And we desire to hang our helpless souls on Christ to appropriate the spotless robe not just to cover and hide our defects, but Lord, not only just to shield us from the wrath of God, but to be a righteousness that would be within us to transform our characters and to help us to perfectly reflect that glory. Lord, this is our desire. And we ask you to take full control of our lives. Pour out thy Holy Spirit, I pray, upon us the rest of this day and upon the rest of this rest of the week. And I pray that each of the speakers would all of us would have our hearts and minds clear and, and pure and lifted up to Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. That the golden oil might flow through and be able to water us as a people. Mm -hmm. So Father, bless us in this time of the latter rain and open our minds and understandings, not only to theology, but also to practicality and how we might live and be Christians. Mm -hmm. We thank you for your goodness and pray that you would bless us this morning in a special way. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.